Okay, well, uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers. Uh, this is not something I do these days very much, giving Zoom talks. It's not something that I thought I would really want to do ever again. I, at least uh, a few years ago, I would have had that perspective, but this is a, a rare privilege, and I'm very happy to, to be here talking to all of you. I see a number of familiar names in the participants list and uh, well, it's good to see you virtually. So I'm gonna begin by saying this is a talk about non-unique factorization, but I'm gonna do a quick recap of what I mean by unique factorization to set things up. So let me start with an integral domain D. Then a non-zero non-unit element of the domain is called an irreducible if it can't be factored as a product of two non-units. And D is called a unique factorization domain if every non-zero non-unit can be written as some product of irreducibles. And this expression is unique up to order and up to unit factors. And because it'll be important a little bit later in the talk, I'll spell out what I mean by up to order and up to unit factors. If I have one product of irreducibles, say the pi i equal to another product of irreducibles, say rho j, then Uniqueness means that there should be the same number of terms on both sides. So K should be L in the notation I have here. And after rearranging the terms, you can make pi I a unit multiple of rho I for every I equals one through K. So this is what is standard to mean by a UFD. Now, in a first course in algebra, you meet many examples of UFDs. And here are the ones which may be your most likely to meet in a first course in algebra. These are the ones that we talk about in our first undergraduate course in algebra at the University of Georgia. There's the ring of integers, the ring of rational integers. I would expect given the audience that this is maybe everyone's favorite example of a UFD. There's the ring of polynomials over a field F, F bracket X, and there's the ring of Gaussian integers A plus B I. Uh, if you trace the history of this, it's it's sort of interesting. So Euclid got quite a ways towards stating unique factorization, but he never quite does it. So it's kind of interesting if you look at the various statements that he makes, how close he gets and yet how he never takes that last jump. So if you want to find the first formal statement of unique factorization together with the first complete proof, it actually doesn't seem to come until the 19th century. So with Gauss and his disquisitionis. And the proofs for F bracket X and Z bracket I also seem to be due to Gauss. Okay, now if you only see examples of unique factorization domains, it's easy to be lulled into a false sense of security. And there is an antidote for this. So there is a very common example that is again, seen in introductory algebra courses. So it's become an almost canonical example of a non-unique factorization domain. And this is the ring z adjoined root negative five. So in this ring, we have two times three is one plus root negative five times one minus root negative five. And well, okay, these two sides, they certainly look different, but you have to check and you can check that this is a genuine example of non-unique factorization. All of two, three, one plus root negative five and one minus root negative five, they are irreducible in z root negative five. And there's no chance that the irreducibles on the left are somehow secretly the same as the irreducibles on the right up to units, because you can also check that the only units in this ring are plus or minus. And so you're not gonna get one plus root minus five out of two times a unit. Okay. So Z root negative five is certainly not a unique factorization domain. One of the points I wanna make in this talk is that there's a sense in which it's close to a unique factorization domain. And you should be asking, well, what in the world does he mean by that? Okay. So I'm gonna talk about maybe what I don't mean by that before I talk about what I mean by that. But before I get to that, let me first zero in on the class of rings I'll be thinking. So the rings that will come up in this talk are all rings that arise out of number fields. So a number field just means a finite extension of Q. To each number field K, there's a ring called O sub K, which we zero in as the central object of study. This is the integral closure of Z and K, just it's the set of all elements in K that are roots of some monic polynomial with integer coefficients. We've already seen a couple of examples of rings of integers in this talk. So the ring of integers of Q adjoin I is the ring ZI that already appeared. 
Uh, the ring of integers of q root negative five is the ring z root negative five. Here are a couple of other examples. The ring of integers of q adjoined q root of two is z adjoined q root of two. The ring of integers of z of q adjoined root five is z adjoined one plus root five over two. Okay. Now, if you're thinking about these rings of integers, we've already seen that z adjoined root minus five is an example that's not a UFD. And well, if that was the end of this talk, it would be a very sad way to end the talk and it would also be a absurdly short talk. So that's not the end. There's more to the story. And well, one chapter, which I think is well known, certainly well known to the people in this audience is that, okay, you don't always have unique factorization into elements, but you always have unique factorization into ideals. So this is a famous theorem of Dedekind that if you look at any of these rings, O sub K, any ring of integers in a number field, every non-zero ideal of OK always factors uniquely as a product of non-zero prime ideals. So if you look in old fashioned books, then you'll see this statement called the fundamental theorem of ideal theory. I think if you look in new books, they don't give this a name, they just say it's true. But I like to call it the fundamental theorem of ideal because it just sounds fancy. Okay, so yeah. As I said, this is a talk about non-unique factorization. And while well, I said that if you think about ideals, then you don't have these problems with non-uniqueness, that's too easy. So I don't wanna think about what goes right. I wanna talk about what goes wrong. That's kind of the focus of this talk. And I wanna talk about how much goes wrong when things go wrong. So in, in terms of element-wise factorization, things can go wrong, but how badly can they go wrong? And there is already a standard way of quantifying this, which is discussed in first courses on algebraic number theory. And I'm gonna give my take on kind of the, the standard uh, narrative about this. So the first thing is, if we're really interested in thinking about factorization of elements, well, it was already apparent in the statement of unique factorization that we didn't really care about units. So let's go ahead and remove units from the picture entirely. And I can do that by just replacing elements with principal ideals. So I'm gonna let int print of K denote the collection of all non-zero principal ideals of the ring of integers of K. And then int print of K makes perfectly good sense as an object under multiplication. It's a monoid under ideal multiplication. And it's essentially just the non-zero elements of OK under multiplication, but I've removed the influence of the units. OK, so I have a monoid under ideal multiplication, int print of K, and saying that OK is not always a UFD says that this monoid does not always enjoy unique factorization. But there's another natural monoid I could consider, which is just the collection of all non-zero ideals of OK. And that's bigger than int print OK. And that monoid does always enjoy unique factorization. That's exactly Dedekind's theory. So one way to quantify non-unique factorization is to think about, OK, how far is the first monoid away from the second monoid? And because the first monoid lives inside the second, you might think, okay, a good measure of that would just be to take a quotient of some kind. And that's basically what you do. So I'm lying a little bit because really what you want to do is you want to look not at the integral ideals, but at the groups of fractional ideals generated by the monoids on the previous slide. So I'll let id k be the group of non-zero fractional ideals of k. I'll let print k be the group of non-zero uh, principal fractional ideals. And I'll define the class group as that quotient, id k mod print k. And yeah, this is typically how one talks about measuring the failure of uniqueness of factorization. And yeah, this way of measuring things has some nice properties. So for example, the class group is trivial. So this quotient is trivial precisely when OK is a UFD. OK, again, that should make some intuitive sense, hopefully, from the way I motivated these things. That should say these two monoids are more or less the same. And id k came from something that we already knew had unique factorization. So it's not surprising maybe when I put it like that. Another beautiful and important fact from algebraic number theory is that if you take this quotient, you're always getting something finite. OK, and so, well, that's comforting because if you have something finite, you can point to it or you can point to the size of it and say, that's my measure of non-unique factorization. And so it's very common to hear in first courses on algebraic number theory that the class group measures the failure of unique factorization. And it's true, but that's not what I want to talk about. Okay, so for me, 
It's not that I don't believe that. It's that I do believe it. I believe the class group knows everything about the failure of unique factorization, but I want it to actually tell us what it knows. So the hard part for me is getting it to speak. And to give you an example of what I mean, I want to go back to the z root minus five thing. So we saw already that unique factorization fails in z root minus five because of this famous example here. Something that is less well-known, though I think well-known to many people in this particular audience, is that unique factorization actually fails, but only halfway in z root negative five. And what do I mean by that? Well, I'm gonna go back to the conditions for uniqueness that I had up on the earlier slides. I said that whenever I have some product of irreducibles equal to another product of irreducibles, I want there to be the same number of terms in both factorizations, and I want the two to match up up to unit factors after rearrangement. Now, in this example, I can't make the two sides match up up to unit factors after rearrangement, but yeah, the two sides do have the same number of factors. They both have two factors. And it's tempting the first time you see this example to say, oh, this is silly. This is just because you were looking at factorizations of the number six. If I had maybe taken a different example in z root minus five, I would be able to cook up a case where I had a different number of factors. But you can't. In fact, it's always the case that no matter what non-zero non-unit element of z root minus five you start with, factor it into irreducibles whichever way you want, you'll always end up with the same number of terms. Okay. So domains with this property have a name, and they're studied in certain segments of the commutative algebra community. The main goal I have with this talk is really to advertise uh, what some of these commutative algebraists are thinking about to the wider number theory community, because I think there could be greater penetration of these ideas than there has been so far. And then towards the end of the talk, as you'll see, I will advertise some new results, but really I'm giving this talk to get out this perspective maybe more widely than, it, than it's been appreciated. Okay, so a domain is a half factorial domain if every non-zero non-unit can be written as a product of irreducibles. And if any two factorizations of the same non-zero non-unit have the same number of irreducible factors. There's a beautiful theorem of Carlitz from 1960 that if you start with a number field K, then the ring of integers is half factorial precisely when the class number is one or two. And this explains what I said about Z root negative five because the class number of Q root negative five is two. As a further illustration, you could look at like Q root negative 23. That has class number three. And so according to Carlitz, it should not be a half factorial domain. And it's not. So here's an example. If I look at 27, I can factor it as three times three times three. And I can factor it as two plus root negative 23 and two minus root negative 23. You can check that all the factors involved are irreducible. And well, they don't have the same number of terms. The left-hand side has three, the right-hand side has two. Okay. So Carlitz's theorem uh, started, well, a number of uh, different investigations, again, mostly in commutative algebra. Maybe about 20 years later, there was uh, a realization that you could pick up the thread of Carlitz's theorem and take it a little bit further. So instead of just talking about when the two sides always involve the same number of irreducibles, you could measure basically the stretchiness. So if you have one factorization in the irreducibles and another factorization in the irreducibles, how much can they differ? Okay, so I want to explain this and this also explains the strange title of my talk. So let me let D be a domain where every non-zero non-unit factors into irreducibles. This is a pretty weak requirement on a domain. It holds, for instance, for all the rings we'll talk about, it holds for any no theory in domain. For any non-unit, non-zero non-unit alpha in the domain, I'm going to define the length spectrum of alpha as just the set of all positive integers k for which alpha has a factorization as a product of k irreducibles. And then I'm going to define the elasticity of alpha as, well, the supremum of the length spectrum divided by the infimum of the length spectrum. Now, the length spectrum is a, is a non-empty set of positive integers. So instead of infimum, I could have written minimum there. That would have been fine. But there are pathological domains where this numerator can be infinite. So that's why I write soup. In the domains we'll care about, the numerator will be finite. But there are pathological domains where the numerator can be infinite. I'm going to define the elasticity of the domain as the supremum of the elasticities of alphas, taken over all non-zero non-unit alphas. And then if you think through these definitions, what you see is that actually 
asking for D to be a half factorial domain is entirely equivalent to asking for the elasticity of the domain to be one. Okay, so this elasticity is somehow measuring something more general than what Carlitz was looking at. You look at any two factorizations of the same element and you ask, what is the, the biggest possible ratio somehow between the number of terms that are involved? And well, the main theorem I wanna advertise is an answer to this question. So uh, this theorem has kind of a funny history. The results were assembled over a number of years. Uh, it may be that the first paper on this subject to be written was a paper of Valenza, but it actually was not the first paper to appear. So I think it appeared in 1990. But if you actually look at the tiny footnote in the article in the journal Number Theory, you can see that it appeared in, that it was submitted in 1980. So it's something funny. I, there has to be a story here that I don't know, but this article somehow took 10 years to appear. But it was worth the wait. So what is the theorem? So first, let me let K be a number field. Let me assume the ring of integers is not a UFD. If it is a UFD, well, that's great then. It's a UFD. In particular, it's an HFD. The elasticity is one. I don't need a formula for the elasticity. If it's not a UFD, then I have a formula for the elasticity. The elasticity is half the Davenport constant of the class. And now whether or not you consider this to be a reasonable theorem depends on whether you know what the Davenport constant is. So let me quickly review what that means. So for a finite abelian group G by the Davenport constant of G, what I mean is the smallest positive integer D so that if you take any D elements of the group, then some subproduct has to have a uh, product being the identity. So every length D sequence of elements of G has a non-empty subsequence whose product is the identity. That's the Davenport constant. Now, if you haven't seen the Davenport constant before, of course, the, the properties are not immediately apparent, but I'll just quickly mention a couple that are useful for orientation. So if you have a finite abelian group of size N, then the Davenport constant is always in most of the size of the group. D of G is in most N. And equality holds if G is sick. In the opposite direction, the Davenport constant of a group of size N is always at least the log base two of the size of the group. And equality holds there if N is an elementary abelian two. So you have D of G sandwiched between these two functions of N and you have equality on both sides in certain cases. So one thing that is somewhat remarkable is that uh, you might think that it would not be so hard to write down a formula for G of D of G in terms of structural invariance of G. So there's this famous theorem that every finite abelian group is a direct sum of cyclic groups, and you, know, you can make it unique if you impose the right conditions. So there should be a formula for D of G maybe in terms of the invariant factors, but no one knows such a formula. There was an old conjecture about what such a formula might be, and the greatest progress we have is now we know that there are infinitely many counterexamples to that formula, but we don't actually have a conjecture for a correct formula or, uh, I mean, even a guess. We don't know what's going on. It's an interesting problem. Okay, so as I said, my main goal in this talk is really to advertise this theorem, which is not my own. And I think in order to advertise it, I should give you some sense of how it's proved. So I'm certainly not going to go into all the details, but I want to sketch a proof of half of the theorem. So remember, the theorem said that the, that the elasticity of the ring of integers is equal to half the Davenport constant. Let me try to convince you that it's at least half the Davenport constant. And for this, I'm going to use a theorem of Landau, which says that every element of the class group is represented by infinitely many non-zero prime ideals of the, of the ring of integers. So nowadays, this is a theorem that would be thought of as a result in class field theory or a quick consequence of results in class field theory. And it is, but of course, Landau was working before class field theory was really a theory. So let me let D be the Davenport constant of the class group. So D is the smallest positive integer, so that if I take any D elements of the class group, some subproduct gives me the identity. That means that it's possible to pick D minus one elements of the class group and have no subproduct be the identity. And I do that. And then I pick primes P1 through PD minus one from those classes using this theorem of Landau. So now I have D minus one prime ideals where no subproduct of those prime ideals is the identity in the class group. In other words, no subproduct of those prime ideals is a principal ideal. 
Well, I want to get a principal ideal out. So now I'm going to choose a dth prime to be in the inverse class of P1 through PD minus. Okay, so that way P1 through PD, the product of all the PIs will be principal. And I can write P1 through PD as say pi times okay. So pi is a generator of that principal ID. Then I claim that the pi I've just constructed has to be irreducible. Why? Well, if I could write pi as a product of non-units alpha and beta, then I could look at the prime ideal factorizations of alpha or the prime ideal factorizations of beta. They would each have to factor into some of the p's. One of them would involve just p1 through pd minus one. And the one that involves just p1 through pd minus one, well, that gives me a subproduct of p1 through pd minus one, which multiplies to a principal ideal, either alpha or beta. And that's not supposed to happen. So that means that I've constructed an irreducible pi whose ideal factorization involves d prime ideals. Okay. And now, how do I continue with this? Well, I'm gonna go ahead and choose another set of d prime ideals in the classes inverse to the classes of P1 through PD. So Q1 is in the class inverse to P1, Q2 is in the class inverse to P2, et cetera. And now you can easily check that by the same argument, if I were to multiply all the QIs, I will again get a principal ideal and it will again be generated by an irreducible. So this irreducible I'm gonna call rho. Okay, and now to get back to elasticity, I'm gonna look at the element rho times pi. On the one hand, and this is not the surprising part of the argument, if you multiply the two irreducibles rho and pi, you get a product of two irreducibles, rho pi. Okay, that I think people believe. The more interesting part is if you multiply rho pi and look at the ideal it generates, then you just get P1Q1, P2Q2, all the way through PDQD. So you get the product of the P is the product of the Qs. And each PIQI, we arrange the Q is in the inverse class of P. So each PIQI is principal. So PIQI is, say, the ideal generated by gamma I. And that means that up to unit factors, I have some sort of equation, rho pi is gamma one through gamma D. And I set up to unit factors, but in fact, all the, the rho, the pi, the gamma i's, they were only determined up to units anyway. They were generators of ideals. So I can make this a true equation just by multiplying rho by a units. So this is a true equation now in OK. And now on the left, I have a product of two irreducibles. On the right, I have a product of d non-units. The gamma i's are certainly non-units because they have prime ideal factors. And I could break the gamma i's maybe further up into irreducibles, but that would only increase the number of terms on the right. And so I'm gonna get a product of two irreducibles on the left equal to a product of at least d irreducibles on the right after I decompose the gamma i's. And that means if you remember how I defined elasticity, it. it means the elasticity of this particular I'm element. Wanted to get a picture of how much Sorry, is there a question? Uh, I think someone's microphone got turned on by accident. Okay, that's right. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, if you remember the definition of the elasticity of rho pi, that means that the elasticity of that element is at least d over two. And so the elasticity of the entire ring of integers, which is the supremum of the elasticities of elements is also at least d over two. Okay, and that is half of this beautiful theorem that I wanted to add. And if you're interested in the other half, I would recommend that this paper of Narkovich, which is something like two or three pages and you know, does the whole thing. Okay. So that was the first half of the talk. And the second half of the talk, I wanna move into, well, the new results, but again, it'll take some time to, to set up what I, what I really wanna talk about. So the theme is something that a lot of people have looked at which is how badly does unique factorization fail as you look across families of rings that come out of number fields. And unfortunately, there's not a lot known here rigorously, despite substantial effort. So this is a very old problem. You could even trace it to work of Gauss. Gauss was not really looking at quadratic fields, but he was looking at some equivalent questions in terms of binary quadratic forms, class numbers or binary Everything I'm gonna say in the rest of this talk is about what you could think of as the simplest case, this, the case of quadratic fields. Uh, it's the case that is easiest certainly for me to study and I'll contend that it's, it's hard enough. So I don't feel bad about just thinking about this case. There are so many hard questions there that 
uh, you know, I'm I'm happy to just be thinking about this particular special case. Okay, so let me review some some of what's known. For imaginary quadratic fields, we know that unique factorization holds only finitely often. So the largest d in absolute value, largest square free d in absolute value for which the ring of integers of q root d is a unique factorization domain is d equals negative 163. This is a famous theorem of Hegner. And we also know from work of Heilbronn that as d gets more and more negative, as d goes to negative infinity, the size of the class group, the class number, tends to infinity. And so if you think about factorization or failure of unique factorization as being measured somehow by the size of the class group, factorization gets worse and worse. If you think about the failure of unique factorization as being measured by the elasticity, you also get factorization getting worse and worse because the remember we had a lower bound on the elasticity of the class group in terms of the logarithm of the class group. So if one goes to infinity, so does the other. So anyway, the point is factorization gets worse and worse in imaginary quadratic fields as the discriminant gets more and more negative. Now, for real quadratic fields, we expect the situation to be rather different. And here we actually think that the class group should be trivial infinitely often. In fact, there are these uh, beautiful heuristics of Cohen and Lenstra that predict that the class number of the fields Q adjoin root P, so just to join the square root of a prime number, that this should be one for a little more than three quarters of all primes P. So there should be infinitely many real quadratic fields with class number one, and in fact, they're not even that thin on the ground. They're pretty common. Unfortunately, this is conjectural. And even though there has been a lot of work understanding the Cohen-Lenster heuristics in recent years, there's a, this is a beautiful uh, project of arithmetic statistics, which has made a lot of progress. The methods we have don't prove theorems like there are infinitely many real quadratic fields of class number less than a million, or even less than 10 to the 10 to the 10th. I think for all we know, the class number of Q root D could tend to infinity with D. We don't think it does, but that's something that I think no one knows how to disprove. So it would seem that if you really wanted to look at, to get infinitely many UFDs out of rings coming from quadratic fields, you'd be out of luck because there's no hope for imaginary quadratic fields. And even though you should have infinitely many UFDs coming from real quadratic fields, no one actually knows how to prove that you do. So what can you do? So I got into the, the topic of this talk. I guess the reason I'm giving this talk is at some point I stumbled across a paper by a mathematician who is not too far away geographically from where I am. This is a commutative algebraist Jim Koikendall at Clemson University. And he asked the following question. Let me not think about UFDs. Let me think about HFDs. Can I find infinitely many half factorial domains by wandering in the land of quadratic fields. And the first time you hear this question, you think, well, no, because if you want your ring of integers to be half factorial, then Carlitz's theorem says that the class number has to be at most two. And I just said, that's only gonna hold for finitely many imaginary quadratic fields. And for all we can prove, it also only holds for finitely many real quadratic fields. So it seems hopeless to produce infinitely many uh, quadratic half factorial domains. But Koikendall said, ah, I didn't say ring of integers. What if you look at subrings of the ring of integers? Okay. So this brings me to quadratic orders. So let me let K be a quadratic field. An order in K is a subring of the ring of integers that properly contains Z. Okay. So the ring OK itself, of course, is, is the biggest possible such thing, and that's called the maximal order. And it's well known that the orders in a quadratic field are in one-to-one -one correspondence with positive integers f. For each positive integer f, you can look at the elements in the ring of integers, which are congruent modulo f to some rational integer. So if you let O f be the set of alpha and OK, alpha is a mod f for some integer a, then that gives you an order, and every order is of the form O f for a unique f, and that f is called the conductor of the order. Now, Non-maximal orders cannot be UFDs. This kind of game that we're playing, looking at non-maximal orders, is not going to give us any more examples of UFDs because, well, they're, they're smaller than the ring of integers, and so they can't be integrally closed, and UFDs have to be integrally closed. But they could still be HFDs. And in fact, this is the kind of thing Koikendall was interested in. 
So in this 2001 paper, Koykendall writes down what I'll call two conjectures. There's a weak form and a strong form. So the weak form, which I've listed as part A, is there are infinitely many half factorial domains where you allow yourself to vary over all quadratic fields and all orders contained in those fields. And then conjecture B is a lot more specific. Don't vary over all quadratic fields. Just look at this one field, Q join root two. And then there are infinitely many half factorial domains just as you vary over the orders in that specific field, Q root two. Now, the point of these conjectures, or at least certainly conjecture A, is not to write down a, a new statement that you know is surprising. Conjecture A is certainly true because as I said, there should be infinitely many UFDs that appear as maximal orders of real quadratic fields, but that seems very difficult to prove. We don't have any shot at that right now, but maybe we have a shot at proving there are infinitely many HFDs where we allow ourselves to vary all of these parameters. And the new result I'll announce is that, yeah, conjecture A is true. And conjecture B is also true if you believe GRH. Okay. So the rest of this talk is really explaining where these things come from. Now, before I do that, I should say something about elasticity of non-maximal orders. And I don't want to say very much because uh, I think the results known here are not as satisfactory as they could be. So I said that for the maximal order, there's this, this beautiful theorem that as long as the maximal order is not a UFD, the elasticity is just half the Davenport constant of the class group. Now for non-maximal orders, there's still a class group. And you might hope that maybe the elasticity is just half the Davenport constant of that class group. But that's not the case. So let me give you a troubling example here. Let's look at Z-adjoin 5i. So Z adjoin 5i, this is an order in the Gaussian field, Q adjoin 5i. It's the order of conductor five. And I'm not gonna prove this, but you can check that the class number of the order is two. What's the elasticity? The elasticity is actually infinite. That's pretty weird. This surprised me the first time I saw it, that the elasticity of Z adjoin 5i is actually infinite. And well, I'm not going to say what, what this is true. If you're interested in solving this exercise, you can look at the slides in detail. They'll be posted on my website, or I guess this talk is being recorded. But basically, you can look at 5 to the k times 2 plus i. Check that that's always irreducible, no matter what k you pick. Same for 5 to the k times 2 minus i. That's also always irreducible. But if you multiply those two irreducibles, you get a product of 5 this huge number of times, 2k plus 1 times. So you get a product of two irreducibles being, well, a product of 2k plus 1 irreducibles. And that means that the elasticity is at least 2k plus 1 over 2. But I could have done this for any k. And so the elasticity is infinite. OK, what's going on here? Well, there's a theorem of Haltercock that if I'm looking at the order of conductor f, then you get finite elasticity precisely when f is not divisible by any prime that, that splits completely in k. So what goes wrong here? Well, five is divisible by five and five splits in Z bracket I is two plus I times two minus. I. Okay, so this is just to convince you that elasticities of non-maximal orders are a little bit weird as an object of study, but you can still say something. And in fact, there was an arithmetic characterization of half factorial orders in quadratic fields, elasticity one orders in quadratic fields. That was obtained independently by Halter, Cock, and Koikin. So I'm gonna say a little bit about the classification. The full classification is just a little too complicated for me to wanna to get into now, but I'll say something about the classification here. The imaginary case is actually very easy and it has a very simple, beautiful answer. If you're interested in non-maximal orders in imaginary quadratic fields, there's only one that's a half factorial domain. It's Z adjoin root negative three, which is the order of conductor two in the field Q adjoin root negative three. So there's precisely one non-maximal quadratic half factorial domain, Z adjoin root negative three. I think that's a great result. The characterization in the real quadratic case is not as simple. So I'll just state some results here. So suppose I have a real quadratic field K, then in order for the order of conductor F to be half factorial, the following conditions are necessary. 
So first, the ambient maximal order, OK, has to be half factorial, which by Carlitz's theorem means the class number has to be one or two. The conductor F itself has to be either a prime or twice a prime. And in the case when it's twice a prime, that prime has to be odd. And the prime I've just been mentioning has to be a prime that's inert in K. Furthermore, if we zero in on the case of orders of conductor P, I just said that to be half factorial, OK has to be half factorial, and P has to be inert in K. If those conditions are satisfied, then OP is a half factorial domain if and only if the two class groups coincide, the class group of the order and the class group of the maximal order. And what do I mean by saying these two class groups coincide? Well, there's a natural surjection from the left-hand side to the right, just mapping the class of I to the class of I, and I want that surjection to be an isomorphism. Okay. So what can I do with this? Well, I'm more of an analytic number theorist than an algebraic number theorist, so this sort of condition that I have here doesn't speak to me directly, but you can reformulate it a bit. If you actually analyze what does it mean for this natural surjection to be an isomorphism, then it turns out that there's a rephrasing in terms of the units of the ring of integers of K. So suppose K is a real quadratic field, and suppose I have a prime P that's inert in K. Then this equation of class groups that I'm asking for is actually exactly the same as asking that the smallest power of the fundamental unit that belongs to the order of conductor P is the P plus one power. So epsilon to the U, where U equals P plus one, should be the smallest power of epsilon, which belongs to the order of conductor P. And this equivalence between the equality and the condition on the right-hand side follows, for instance, from the class number formula for orders, or you know, an analyzing the map that was hidden on the previous slide, that's rejection. Okay, I won't go into why this is true. As I said, you, know, you can look at the, the proof of the class number formula and you'll see it. But I do want to point out that it is at least easy to see something that maybe is not apparent if this is your first time coming to the subject. It is at least easy to see that epsilon to the P plus one does land in OP. I'm asking for P plus one to be the smallest exponent for which it lands in OP, but it's at least easy to see that epsilon to the P plus one does land in OP. And the reason for that is that OP consists of the elements of the ring of integers that are congruent to a rational integer mod P. And if you take epsilon to the P plus one and you reduce it mod P, you get epsilon times epsilon to the P, but working mod P, epsilon to the P is just the Frobenius acting on epsilon. And because P is inert, the Frobenius is conjugation. So you just get epsilon times its conjugate, which is the norm. And that is a rational integer, it's plus or minus. So epsilon to the P plus one is plus or minus one mod P. So it's an OP. Okay, I'm gonna reformulate it a little bit more. So when is P plus one the smallest positive integer where epsilon to the U is NOP? That's the question we're after. Well, let me view Z mod P as a subfield of the ring of integers mod P. This is just the usual thing we do in algebraic number theory with residue fields. Then asking for U, for U equals P plus one to be the smallest exponent I want is actually just the same as asking that epsilon be a generator of this quotient of unit groups. So I look at OK mod P, that unit group there. I look at the subfield ZP, that unit group there. When I quotient it out, I'm going to get a group of size P plus one. And asking my condition on epsilon says that epsilon mod P should generate this group GP. Okay, so what's the upshot here? Let me let K be a fixed real quadratic field of class number one or two. Then OP is a half factorial domain for infinitely many primes p, if and only if there are infinitely many primes p that are inert in k, for which the image of epsilon mod p generates this group gp, depending on p. Do we expect that there are infinitely many of these primes p? Well, it was pointed out by Allen that you need one extra condition. The norm of epsilon should be negative one, the norm of the fundamental unit. Otherwise, you can show this is hopeless. You can show that the order of epsilon Will, will not be P plus one if P is odd. We'll divide P plus one over two. So let me go ahead and assume that extra hypothesis that the norm of epsilon is negative one. Then are there infinitely many primes P inert in K for which the image of epsilon generates this, this group that varies with P? Okay. 
Well, now this is a question that an analytic number theorist, or at least one with the same inclinations as me, can really wrap it, their heads around because it looks an awful lot like an old conjecture of Emil Arden. So Arden said, okay, let me take an integer, not negative one and not a square. I'm gonna ask whether there are infinitely many primes P where gener G generates the multiplicator group Z mod P. This is a very similar question. In my problem, I have a fixed something. I didn't call it G, I called it epsilon. I have a group that varies with P. I'm asking, do I have a generator mod P as P varies infinitely often? Now, the bad news is that Arden's conjecture is still open, but it's settled under GRH. This was done by Hooley in 1967. And so this maybe gives one some hope that the problem I was interested in could be settled under GRH, and indeed it can be. And that's essentially what I announced earlier. So I'm not working in the integers, I'm working in a quadratic field. So you need a quadratic field variant of Arden's conjecture, not Arden's conjecture itself. But these have already been investigated. So I've mentioned the names here of a few people who have thought about this. And there's a paper of Yen Mei Chen, which gives almost exactly what I need. So there's one tiny tweak I have to make to her argument, but it's almost all in, in her paper. And well, you get a nice theorem out of this. Okay, so let me just announce more fully what follows from uh, these methods on Arden's conjecture. So I'm gonna call the real quadratic K viable if K has class number one or two and fundamentally unit of norm negative one, then if you assume GRH, every viable real quadratic field has infinitely many orders of prime conductor inside it, which are half factorial domains. And the scope of this theorem is best possible in the sense that if K is a real quadratic field, which is not viable, then in most finitely many orders in K are half factorial. And that follows from results of Halder, Cockwick, and Allen, and Allen. That was already known. And okay, as people who've worked on these uh, Arden conjecture problems will know, when you can prove a theorem like this, in principle, you can also compute a density. When k equals q root 2, you can actually show that the proportion of primes p for which the order of conductor p inside z root 2 is a half factorial domain is half of A, where A is this funny constant I've given here is an Euler product called the Arden constant. Okay. I also mentioned some kind of unconditional result on quadratic HFDs. I said that you could prove without any hypothesis that there were infinitely many HFDs as you varied over all quadratic fields and all orders contained inside them. Where does that come from? Well, again, the inspiration is from work on Arden's primitive root conjecture. Now, unconditionally, Arden's primitive root conjecture is, is still open, as I said before. And in fact, we can't even point to a single specific integer G, which we know generates the multiplicative group mod P for infinitely many primes P. For example, we don't know if seven is a generator of Z mod P cross for infinitely many primes P. So that's terrible. But the good news is that, that somehow, even though we can't point to a specific G, which we know works, we know it works for many G that we just can't point to. So what does that mean? Well, there, there's a remarkable uh, chain of events that was, was set off by a, a paper of Murdy and Gupta. And I'm not gonna quote the result of their paper, but after their paper, there was a paper of Murdy Srinivasan and a paper of Heath Brown, where they proved a theorem of the following form independently. So there's some constant M, I'll say what M is in a second, such that if you list any M different primes, at least one of them will generate uh, Z mod P Z cross for infinitely many primes P. And Heath Brown has the, the better constant M using stronger sieve methods, he gets that M is three. So if you take any three primes, at least one of them will be a generator of Z mod P cross for infinitely many primes P. Okay, so this looks like the kind of thing that could be useful in the problem we were looking at. Again, we would need a quadratic field analog and well, again, problems like this have already been looked at. There were some articles by Joseph Cohen in the early 2000s looking at uh, porting over these sorts of techniques to quadratic fields. What he does, his theorems are not quite applicable in the context that, that I want. So you have to rework the method, but it goes through. And you can prove the following. So let me take any 46 viable linearly disjoint real quadratic fields. Viable was the condition on the previous slide. 
linearly disjoint means that I want my fields to be have as as much nothing in common as possible. So I want the composite to actually have maximal possible degree, two to the 46. If you take any 46 viable linearly disjoint real quadratic fields, there has to be one of them in that list, which contains infinitely many HFD orders inside it. In particular, this implies after a short computation that if you look at the real quadratic fields Q root D, then there's some D less than a thousand for which the ring of integers has infinitely many HFD orders inside. Okay, so just in the last couple of minutes, I wanna say something about elasticities larger than one. Everything so far has been about half factorial orders. What about elasticities larger than one? So if you're gonna ask that about this, it maybe makes some sense to think about what are the possible elasticities that you could even see. And you can show that if you take a quadratic field K, then well, I'm not gonna go into this because this description is not so important. I'll just say twice the elasticity is the certain is a supremum of a certain set of positive integers. Okay, so twice the elasticity is the supremum of a set of positive integers, which means that the elasticity itself is either infinite or it's half an integer. Okay, so that's what I really wanna emphasize here. The elasticity of any order inside any quadratic field is either infinity or it's one of the numbers one, three halves, two, five halves, three, seven halves, et cetera. So what have I been looking at lately? Well, let me call the quadratic field K universally elastic. If the full ring of integers is a UFD, that's the only order in K that could be a UFD, the full ring of integers, I'm gonna ask that it is. And then I'm gonna ask that everything in my list of possible elasticities one, three halves, two, five halves, all of those, and infinity, those should all occur as elasticities of orders in K, but not just occur once, occur infinitely often. And then what I can prove is that, yeah, if you assume GRH, then, well, there are universally elastic quadratic fields, and in fact, Q root two is universally elastic. So in some sense, you see every possible factorization behavior as measured by elasticity, just among the sub, sub rings of Z adjoint root two. And okay, this theorem here is maybe a little bit weaker than what you would expect. The maybe the correct condition here is that every viable field K, which viable was just defined really to ensure elasticity one, but infinitely often, but I suspect that every viable K is actually universally elastic. That I can't quite prove. So that would follow from GRH and some plausible hypotheses on some on these primes that are somehow like v frit primes in a certain sense. But I think that's what I wanted to, I'm, I'm gonna skip this. I'm gonna say, that's what I wanted to say. So thank you for your attention.